Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he came near to Beth, Bethage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to them, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent their way, or so those who were sent, who, who, who were sent, went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of, of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their clothes on the colt, and they, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on, on the road. Then as he, um, as he was now drawing near, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep quiet, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your, your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children with you to the ground and they will not leave you in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Let's pray together. Lord, we're, we're so grateful for the opportunity to look at all that that's revealed in these verses today. Lord, we recognize that you said that your word will outlive the heavens and the earth and what a privilege it is for us to study your word. We thank you that um, you've, you've inspired your people to write it, Lord, and we we trust in it. We thank you that you've been working in our lives to to help us um, understand it and to apply it and to be changed and transformed through it. So right now we ask that your your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that he would um, do what only he can do. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In my pastoral experience, I haven't always done uh, taught Palm Sunday messages. Um, and so each year I kind of pray of whether or not the Lord wants to, fo to, to have a special sermon on it. Um, this year he's led me to this passage. And I re recognize for those of us that are here normally, um, we've, we've gone through this in recent months because we've been going through the book of John. But there are some things that the Lord's laid on my heart in these verses that I want to bring out this morning. So this day, in, in what's going on here, this is the 10th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar, which is our late, uh, it covers late, our late uh, March and our early April. And it, it was like their ecumenical beginning of their ecumenical year. And uh, it's their great, you know, the great feast of the tap, of Passover rather was was up, you know, right there. And this is the day that they would, um, they would have the lambs inspected. So they would, the people would present their lambs that were the Passover lambs to be inspected by the priests. They would present them and inspect them. And they, these lambs had to be without spot or blemish. A spot is something you're, they would be born with. A blemish would be something they would acqu uh, acquire over time, it had to be a perfect lamb. So it's so fitting that today, Jesus, on this day, Jesus uh, presents himself to, as, to, as the Messiah. He, he inspects, they inspect him, in a sense, and, and he, he's presented as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as the coming King, the Messiah, and he's inspected. And so this is what's called a triumphant entry. And 
it, if you kind of look at it, when you really study it, and, and, and a version of it is in, in, in all four Gospels, uh, it, it kind of is hap- it's a happy occasion, but at the same time, it's a very sad occasion. And we'll, we'll look at both, and, and, and uh, mostly on the sad part, probably. Uh, but, you know, you see this whole uh, scene unfold, and, and we're going to see the good part, that represents the, you know, the the happy part, and then we're going to see the sad part or the, you know, the bad part. That's the part that um, was arresting Jesus's heart and what he was mostly concerned about. So let's start that this day of it was a day of publicly acknowledging Israel's king, Israel's Messiah, but not nearly to the extent that he should have been acknowledged. This was an unsanctioned event. It was unsanctioned by Rome, of course. It was unsanctioned by uh, Herod Antipas. Uh, Herod Antipas would have, would, was in the city at this point for the feast. He was the ruler over Galilee. And, and that's why um, Pilate's going to refer, uh, you know, when Jesus is arrested and all that, uh, he's going to have him come before Herod Antipas because of that. And then it was unsanctioned by Caiaphas, the high priest. It was unsanctioned by the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling body of that time. And, and so this should have been a huge event to honor Jesus. This should have been a huge celebration from everybody. And what we need to see when we think about this is we need to see that man didn't initiate this. You know, you don't catch that when you're looking, just looking at the surface necessarily. And for sure, the people that showed up on that day, they had no idea how it started. Maybe from their perspective, they felt like the peop, some people initiated this. Maybe the disciples initiated it. They wouldn't know. They were just coming and seeing him, him coming on this colt, this, this, this male young donkey. And, and this is totally acknowledged. They're totally acknowledging that he is the coming king, but they had no idea who initiated it. And, he, and Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. He's heading towards Jerusalem. He's, and, and so this is before the, the um, you know, this is before the events that we're studying in John right now. Uh, so we're backtracking a little bit. But Jesus is, has been on the backside of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives um, had little towns all on the backside of it. You know, I'm talking about opposite side of, of Jerusalem in terms of the city and the, the, the Temple Mount and all of that. And so he came near Bethany and Bethphage and just, just before the peak. And then we're told in, in verses 29 through 31 that the disciples, he told the disciples to go into a nearby village and they'd find a colt or a young male donkey. Matthew tells us that uh, Jesus in, included that, the, that he would, they would also find this colt with its mother. And, and also that no one had ever ridden on this colt. We're also told that Jesus told them to loose it and not ask first. Uh, you would, you know, maybe imagine that Jesus would would say, "Hey, ask the owners when you see this colt. Ask the owners, uh, and and they will let you take this colt." He didn't do that. He said, "Loose it first. Go ahead and take it." I don't know if it was. I don't know if you could categorize it as as uh, stealing. Maybe as borrowing. Uh, you know, I think it was probably more of borrowing. We don't know if this thing ever ended up back with its owners or not. Can you imagine the, the money? Some weird, weird people would, it's like to charge to, to ride on the donkey. It would be, if it was today, you know, people would be setting up these auctions and things that you can ride the donkey, come ride the donkey, you know, and, and, uh, we don't know what happened to it. It's just, it's crazy how man tries to take advantage of, of all these things for bad purposes. But they said, if anyone asks you say, the Lord has need of it. And Jesus knew that that would that answer because it did happen. We're told that that did happen, and and you know you think about how you know God knows what's going to happen, and He'd already been working in the heart. Whatever He had to do in that heart, because there was no fight, there was no um, like no. He has need of it. I have need of it. You know, I have more need of it. You know, there was no fighting back. He'd already been working in the heart of those owners there, and He He always works on both ends when He does something. He's always working on both ends and we don't see it, but he's, he, when he's orchestrating things, we don't see the full picture. And so, um, they went and did this. They asked the question, they were fine. And, and so they brought this young donkey to Jesus. And this is the beginning now of the good part. This is the beginning of the part that 
we, we know um, is appropriate, and I'm happy to see it. I'm happy that he's acknowledged as the king, even though it was a small little sliver uh, of you know, what obviously it should have been, but he was acknowledged there. And um, I'm so glad that, that, he, re- that, that the, the, he led the disciples to write these things. Uh, by the way, Luke is the only Gentile writer in the New Testament, and, and so he's recording these things uh, very, with great spe- specificity and detail. He was a physician, so all the, anato- all, all the anatomical words and things that have to do with, with technicality, he gets those things spot on. Um, and and you, you learn that when you go through the Gospel of Luke. So what I want to focus on, though, at least at, at our beginning here, is that Again, this was God's idea. This was no man's idea. Jesus initiated this. He, and, and he set these things in motion. He arranged it, and he's the initiator, and, and the people were responding to something. And, and, and I love that he does that. Even in, you know, with our worship and how we live a Christian life, you know, we're, he's the initiator, and we're the responder. We don't try to do anything to try to, we shouldn't anyway, try to get God's love and God's mercy and God's favor uh, because God's already done all the work. He sent Jesus to die on the cross. He already demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't expect it. We didn't, we weren't looking for it. And it wasn't man's idea. Romans clearly, or in 1 Corinthians, clearly reveal that no man thought of thought of the gospel. No man thought up this plan of salvation. It was, it was God's idea to be able to come in human flesh himself, be mistreated by man, and, and die for man so that he could offer righteousness that man could never have. Because none of us are perfect. None of us are sinless. None of us can save ourselves because it's based on righteousness. And God's the one that defines what that righteousness should be. And, it, and, and the righteousness that he requires to go to heaven without Jesus is perfection, which all of us fall short of. See, the world believes that we believe that we do everything that we do to try to earn a right standing with God and try to earn heaven. What they don't know is what scripture teaches is that we could never be good enough to out, outperform our sin or to compensate for our sin and that the standard is perfection. People measure themselves against other people. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. We always do that. How come when we talk about righteousness that we're always comparing ourselves to someone that's worse than us on a human level? No one ever compares themselves to God because that's what he's measuring our righteousness against is him. That's why all of us fall short because if, if works could do it, then the Jews could have made it. They had a law, amazing law. If works could do it, but it couldn't. It couldn't do it. We can't. We can't un, undo our sin. We have there are crimes that we've committed, and God would not be just if He allowed those things to be um, not not um, you know adjudicated. He would be unjust. So God is doing this great work in His great heart, and 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 showing the disciples and the world and the Jewish nation who He was. And so we're told in verse 37, then he, um, as he was, was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God um, with a loud voice and for all the mighty works they had seen. So before this, the disciples that brought the, 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 um, the little colt to Jesus, they laid his, their clothes, it says their very own clothes on the colt, their outer clothes, and and then they placed Jesus on, they placed Jesus on this colt. He didn't independently just climb up and get on this colt. It was this, I believe, was the beginning of worship for them to recognize. I think they were getting a, a sense of what was happening, and 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 that this is this is very significant. And they placed him as as like an act of honor, I believe, helped him or carried him completely up onto this cult and and that was the beginning of of this whole you know worship and acknowledgement that jesus is the jewish messiah and 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 the jewish king now notice we're told in verse 37 the whole multitude how many were there we don't know 
You know, today you can go to Israel and you can go walk down this path that, that, that he went down, the traditional path. And, and it's, it's the real path. You can walk down it. And, and on Palm Sunday, there's tens of thousands of people that walk down that path as, a, as, a, as a, just a commemoration of what he did and remembering what, what he did. You can plan your trip to be able to do that. So we're not told, but we're told in the verse that they, that they are disciples. So they are disciples, and not meant probably all of them there. But you know, you, you have no idea just the amount of of, of ruckus. That's an old word, but that this would cause all these people coming, and they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, and and they, you know, and it says that they did that for all the mighty works they had seen. What had they seen? They had seen miracles. They'd seen him do what only he could do. Maybe blind Bartimaeus, he'd already healed him. You know, maybe lepers were, were there. Maybe people that were born blind. Maybe people, I mean, all these miracles that he did, they had witnessed those things. They, they, Jesus had, had, had done so much. John talks about in his gospel, and we'll see it at the end of the book, that if all the works were, were recorded, probably not the whole, all the libraries that in the world could contain the works that he did that we only know a very small percentage of what Jesus actually did, and so um, I wonder how many people were skeptics, though, and I wonder how many people were hadn't seen these things or heard rumors or you know not they didn't they didn't know and they were open and and all those things. Sometimes I wonder how unbelievers can think. Um, all of our love and what we dedicate our lives to and, and all these things in our worship can all be just made up and psychosomatic. You know, I think of my friends that I've known for my whole, some of them my whole life. And I just wonder how can they think that this is all, they've watched me for over 30 years. How could all of what, what I'm about, what I share, how I'm excited, my posts on social media, all these things is all just this made-up mirage in my mind. It's so psychosomatic, wishful thinking, blind faith, all these things could produce this kind of devotion and love that the body of Christ shows and, and, that, and that I show. It's, it's amazing to me. But they so often are, are just fully consumed about their own situation. And in fairness to them, they're not necessarily exposed to a lot of other believers, let's say, or, or you know, the church world or whatever it is, but we're not just, our lives have been changed. If you're listening to this, whether you're here or online, our lives have been changed, transformed. I just got done sharing my, my testimony yesterday with the brother, and it was so great to be able to go through the detail and, and every single detail about what happened to me as a 20-year-old surrendering his life to Christ and never turning back, 100% of that was real. 100% of it was, is, is true. And I love hearing these stories. That's why occasionally we have people come up and share their, their salvation stories up here. It's, they're so powerful. Remember, no one can argue with what's happened to you. So just be bold in sharing that. So we're told from the other Gospels that he said, Hosanna, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now, save now. And unfortunately, most of the people that are, are, ta are thinking of save us from Rome, save us from this occupation, save us from um, all these things that we hate. They weren't necessarily thinking about save me spiritually. That's what we think of when we, when we look at it, spiritually. Now, I still believe there are people there that knew their spiritual need, recognized that Jesus was the answer, and put their faith in him. And they were including, and not just the, the save now part, that they were wanting Jesus to save them spiritually as well. So, the, and even the apostles, because he told them multiple times that he's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners and he would die and all of that. But maybe they were thinking at the time, okay, I don't know about all that, or if they forgot about it, but this is it. This is it. He's coming in on this donkey into town, proclaiming himself to be king, and, and, and then we're going to be free from all this oppression. And, and yet, yeah, I know he said that or whatever, but, you know, look at, maybe he changed his mind. You know, maybe this is happening, thinking that there's, this is momentum. This is what we've been waiting for. Daniel chapter 9 reveals that the Messiah would be cut off. 
And for whatever reason, they didn't focus on those scriptures. Some rabbis did. When you study history and you study what the rabbis wrote, obviously they covered Daniel, they knew about Daniel, but they interpreted it differently sometimes. But there's a lot of rabbis that believe these things were messianic and that he would be cut off. And that's what brought many of them to believe that there would be two messiahs, one that was going to be cut off as a suffering servant for the people, and then another that would be a conquering king. They just didn't know that Jesus would be coming twice. They didn't understand that. So they acknowledged Jesus was their king. So that's all we have of the good part. You know, unfortunately, there's, um, there's, there's, there's another part here that, that, that's uh, grieving to the Lord. This is the sad part. Well, we already have a little bit of sadness because there should have been the whole city, all of Jerusalem should have been there acknowledging that he is the, the promised Messiah. But we see that it begin, the, the sad part in, in, in verse 39. Look with me there. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. So they wanted him to stop. They wanted, he didn't just say, you know, this is a multitude of disciples. We saw Luke right here. So he, he was, tell them to stop. If you are the Messiah, you can tell these people to stop. The problem is, so called, that if, the, if, if he is the Messiah, why would he tell people to stop? It doesn't make any sense. So they thought this was fake. They thought this was manufactured, talking about the religious leaders. And again, there's the sad part, because those are the people that, and he rebukes them so uh, thoroughly in the Gospel of Matthew, especially, talking about them being blind guides and making, making traveling so far to make a disciple only to make them twice the, you know, the, son, of, the son of the devil as they were and, and putting on heavy loads on them, not willing to lift the loads from them, talking about spiritually. They should have been leading the nation in worshiping of him, but they were corrupt and they wanted power and they were threatened by his power. And also, despite what they claimed, they weren't great students of the Bible to the extent which they claimed because they should have known a lot of these prophetic scriptures and that he was uh, uh, qualified to be who he said he was. And notice Jesus' answer in verse 40. But he acknowledged, or he answered, and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, why would, why would the stones, why would he say that? Why would he say that stones potentially would cry out if they didn't, if they weren't saying these things, if they weren't saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why would the stones cry out? Was that hyperbole? Would, would, would God make the stones cry? I don't know. Get into all that stuff. People stay up at night and drink too much coffee and go over this stuff and argue and everything. I don't, I don't get involved in all this stuff. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? I don't know. Why would angels want to dance on the head of a pin? You know? So, uh, Yeah. But they, this was a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. I want to read it to you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So this was prophesied by Zechariah. This is, this is written about 500, a little over 500 BC, hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And what's interesting is that these events that were, were happening here and, and where they were, they were prophesied to take, to take place. So some, something, someone's going to be rejoicing. So if the people don't rejoice, the full prophecy cannot fail. God's word cannot fail. And so the this is, this is going to be something that I guess he would, he would make the, croc, the rocks cry out because someone's going to rejoice and fulfill this prophecy. Sadly, these Pharisees' hearts are probably harder than these rocks because they should have understood the message. They should have been receptive, but, but they weren't. It just shows you how, how bad our hearts can be apart from the Lord that we can have all these things be fulfilled. See, he said they wouldn't be guilty if I hadn't done the things that I did. They wouldn't be guilty by the works themselves. Plus, he fulfilled so much scripture, but he called them more accountable for the works that he did, the miracles 
that he did. And they ascribed it to Satan. They tried every accusation you can think of. He's possessed by Satan and you know, he, he's it, like his father is Satan, all these things that he was saying. And, and, but it was legitimate what he, what he did. And, and so their hearts were super hard. Jesus deserved to have everybody acknowledge that he was king. Everyone acknowledge he was the, the promised Messiah. That's what he deserved. That's what's hard for us. Because we know he was so good in every way. He said at one point, who among you convicts me of sin? You know, he said to the disciples, I always do those things which please the Father. Something all of us are, are you know, depending upon the Lord for us to bear fruit to the point where we can say that. You know, I don't think any of us will ever be able to say that because we've, we, we don't always do those things that please the Father. That's perfection right there. So that's, that's something that really can search our hearts. And um, we love the fact that he, he had that acknowledgement for that small moment, even though it was, it was misplaced in the sense of what they thought he was going to be king for, but he still was acknowledged as the king, as the Messiah. So I love that. Now, verse 41 says, Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. And the word saw there in verse 41, it means to intently gaze. Have you ever had somebody, uh, you're, you're, you're talking with somebody and you're driving in a car, let's say, and, and you know, they're just staring ahead and you're saying stuff and you're just like repeating and they're like in another place, you know, and you, you wave your hand in front of their, their well, you totally you keep your, you know, eye on what you're doing. You're not just like, hey, you know, uh, and not driving, but, and, and they're just, we may, may say where they're zoned out or whatever. They're, they're just intently looking at something, their mind somewhere else. That's kind of the idea here. There was so much that he would take in as he's on this path there. What was going through his heart and mind? Was he looking ahead into the future, 50 years when the Romans would come and lay siege to the city? He's going to talk about that. Was he thinking and looking ahead into the people suffering as a result of that? He's going to talk about that too. Was he thinking about what could have been if everybody had received him? Was he thinking about the people that, I, I don't know. But he was looking at this city with so much intent, uh, intentness and, and focus, and, and he wept. He wept over it. You know, it's easy to pass over that. It's easy to pass over that he wept. He looked at this city. He had such great, deep love for this city and the people in the city. And he knew that they were going to suffer so much. And it grieved him. You know, he talked about that he, in another gospel, about how, you know, I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not believe. You would not. Not that they could not. They would not. It was a decision that they made to reject. So it was kind of a mixed situation. And this word for weeping, he's convulsing like out loud, very sad. He's weeping over. I don't know what the disciples were thinking when they realized this. I don't know how close the disciples were. I don't know. I don't think they were just right along next to him, you know, in terms of just, I mean, who knows what the situation was, but, but at least by the Holy Spirit, God revealed to them that he was weeping to this extent because these people were going to suffer so much. And it was so unnecessary in one sense. He was so willing. But for these things to cascade and to kind of careen towards, from man's perspective, out of control, though it wasn't out of control, that there needed to be a reason why he ended up on that cross dying for mankind. We're told that he, the, the, that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. This wasn't taking God by surprise. Jesus came to die. That's why he came. Things weren't careening out of control in reality, but he was, he was so willing, he was so willing. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. His own received him not. The, the people, his very own people, he was Jewish. His own people rejected him. Three times in the New Testament, we're told that Jesus wept. We've already seen the first one uh, in the book of John when we, when we talked about him raising Lazarus from the dead. Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, the shortest verse of the, the New Testament, uh, 
John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. And then there's this time where he's weeping over Jerusalem. And then also in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, when speaking of his cries in the Garden of Gethsemane, talked about he cried out with tears and, and of wanting the, the, for the Lord to, the Father, to let this cut pass if there's any other way. And he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, which medically they proved is possible, by the way. And, and he had, we don't even understand that agony that he went through uh, in, in the garden there, or in the Garden of Gethsemane. But of, this is what, why I bring that up. Of the three times that we see him cry, this is the only time of the three times that everyone else was happy and rejoicing, except the Pharisees, of course, but in terms of people that b- believe that he was the Messiah. So those, he's weeping, everyone else, everything's uh, going on around him. Everyone's happy, rejoicing, but he's not. And that's sometimes crying in the context, crying in this context when everyone else is happy, sometimes those, that's one of the most painful cries you can have. I don't know if you've experienced that. I've experienced that. And, and so the human part of Jesus understands all of that. Of course, the deity part understands that as well, but he experienced it you know, in real life, in, in human life, in his public ministry of what he went through. When everything's supposed to be going well and everyone's happy, and it could be for legitimate reasons, obviously, but you know, also his heart is, is going somewhere else and thinking about other things. And so uh, it's interesting that, you know, God focuses as he inspired these writers to focus us on this. He, you know, the writer, he could have led the writers to talk all about more, way more specifics on the rejoicing and the happiness and, and all of that, but he doesn't do it. By the Holy Spirit, he emphasizes here that Jesus's heart was broken for the people that rejected him. And, and he want, he wanted to save them. He didn't have this hard heart and say, okay, you know, you know, I don't care about you. You don't care about me. I don't care about you. That wasn't his heart. That's not God's heart. You know, people that we're reaching out to and we're, we're trying to show our love towards, it's hard to keep sharing, keep loving when they're not being loving back and they're, and they're rejecting and, and, and everything. And that's when we need Jesus to help us. We need, we need Jesus's heart, ask for his help to, for our hearts because our hearts are hurting. And there may be other people, and I know this from ministry, I try to encourage young pastors in this, um, that it's normal. Don't be shocked in ministry when things are going really well and you, you, you think everything's going really well in so many areas, but then in other areas, they're not going well. And you would think that you just think that if some or the majority or most or whatever things are going well, that you're, that you're going to, everything's going to keep going great all at the same time. But that doesn't, that isn't what happens. And that doesn't happen in our lives. We can have things that are going on that are great, but at the same time, things are going on that are bad all at the same time. That's why here as a family, we need to be rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those that, that weep and not disconnect our hearts from, from those in our family here. Because God wants us to have a heart for, for everyone's situation at all times, no matter if it's good or it's bad, and be there for, for each other. And, it's in, in, and that's what's it's hard to do. You need, we need God's help to be able to do that. And um, so I believe that he, his heart was for all the people there. And he loves people so much. He had such a shepherd's heart that he was so concerned about all the people that were rejecting him, the consequences of that. And, and he, just, he just had that heart, and it grieved him that they would suffer the consequences of their unbelief. Now look at verse 32. That's what Jesus said. If you had known, he's talking to Jerusalem, over Jerusalem. If you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Now the word know there had known there in verse 42, the word known there is our word gnosko, knowledge by experience. He's saying, if you had known by experience the truth of me and, and, and appropriated me and received me, then, then that, would, that was my plan for you, but that didn't happen. And because of that, things were hidden from their eyes. And he says, especially, notice in the middle of verse 42, especially in this your 
day. That means if you're new to the Bible, you don't know what he's talking about here. But what happened was there was a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 talking about that after so many, so much time on that day, then the Messiah would be presented and cut off for the people. And that time clock started when in Nehemiah chapter 2, when uh, Artaxerxes gave this decree to, re- to let Nehemiah rebuild the wall. And he made that decree, and 483 day, uh, years later, which is 173,880 days, and I say that because this day, Palm Sunday, was the fulfillment of that prophecy. So when he says, especially, especially in this day, this your day, you notice he says it's theirs. This day belonged to them, the Jewish people, belonged to them because it was their Messiah that God promised. Of course, it's the Messiah of the whole world. He would use them to be a light to the Gentiles. The gospel would go out. But he's like, this is your day of all the days that you could miss me. This is the worst day for that to happen because there is no other day that would never happen again to be prophesied to the day. So it's just amazing to see what Jesus is saying. And then he says, the things which make for your peace, because God brings peace. The world's looking for peace and doesn't have much, doesn't have any real peace from God. And, you know, and so that made, was made possible by Jesus fulfilling all these prophecies and dying on the cross for our sins that we're going to be celebrating this coming weekend in, in a, you know, as our yearly tradition, we celebrate it every day, but especially on Good Friday, it's good. It was good for us and, and, and we, we love that, but in a sense, it's not, it's the day that was, it was, there's just like the, the cross, there was great things about the cross for us, but really bad things for um, how we demonstrated our wicked hearts, because it's our sin that put him on the cross. He died for all of our sins. And, and, and so we have to pause and think about that. The consequences begin in verse 43, he talks about, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So 50 years later, Jesus predicted this when the disciples said, look at the temple as if Jesus had never seen it before, you know, and he's like, not one stone will be left upon another. Because in in AD 70, the Roman general Titus did come and he conquered this city. He did surround them. He surrounded the whole city, cut off their supply lines as as a common tactic, and he closed in on them from every side. And and, and he absolutely leveled Jerusalem. And they killed men, women, children. They leveled buildings, homes. They, They leveled the entire temple. Um, and even when you go there today, you can see certain of the stones that the Romans tumbled down. They left there. They're still there. You can see them today when you go there. It's pretty incredible. All that's left is a wet, called the Western Wall. It was a retaining wall. And there's foundation stones. You can see them when you go there. You take a tour and you can go along the, the, the side of the foundation stones underground. And they are, you know, 30 feet tall, um, you know, probably... 20 feet wide, and they're just perfectly placed next to each other. No mortar, perfectly placed. They don't know how, how they did that. I think people were a lot more, you know, a lot smarter than we are in some ways in terms of engineering. Um, but that's all that's left, and that's why the Jews valued that that Western Wall so much. And they, they it's called the Wailing Wall because it's a place of prayer where they've for centuries have gone to, to to pray. And they they write little prayers on little pieces of paper and tuck them and put them inside the cracks and, and and everything. And that's the closest they've come. What they don't know is that there's going to be a third temple. They don't know that yet. There's going to be a third temple, and and the coming world ruler is going to reign. And then he's going to defile that after three and a half years. And Daniel talks about that. When you study Daniel, he gets into that this, this man will, will you know, basically break his covenant halfway through. And Jesus warned about it in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, talking about when you see that happen, the abomination that causes desolation that Daniel referred to, run, talking to Jews, run at that time. Don't even go back to your house. 
uh, because he's going to turn on them and they're going to seek refuge. So, and the last part I want to talk about is the last part of verse 44 where he says, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The word time there is the word kairos. There's two main words for time in the New Testament. One is chronos. We get our word chronology. That means like this, you know, basically sequential events. But kairos means opportune events. Sometimes it's translated opportunity in the New Testament. It's a very specific opportune time. And so he says, you did not know, know by experience, the kairos or the opportunity of your, of your visitation, the very, very specific time. You can't get any more specific than, than him prophesying to the day when the Messiah would be publicly presented to Israel. It gives us tremendous confidence in the word of God and tremendous confidence in Jesus' mission because if, if Jesus didn't fulfill all those prophecies, nobody did and nobody will. So uh, I love the fact how Luke uses that word kairos. They did not recognize that. And they squandered the privilege of God sending their Messiah to them. And people, it, you know, it's sad. Jesus wept over it. And, and, and the consequences of that were very, very sad. But we can, as we think about this for us in terms of presenting the gospel to people, the gospel is the means by which we come into a personal relationship with God. We can have this desire for people to know Christ and have and get to enjoy what we enjoy. And, and, and he doesn't want people to suffer the consequences. We don't want people to suffer the comp- consequences of missing out on the opportunity, but people do. Because there are divine appointments. We like to talk about as believers. There are divine appointments where God sets somebody up with us, you know, and we have the gospel. We need to be able to have boldness to preach the gospel. We, and they don't recognize. I don't know how many of you have had people not recognize that God is trying to intervene in their lives. He's trying to bring them the truth of the gospel and they don't see it. They don't recognize it. And it hurts us. It hurts, it hurts the Lord's heart. He wants them to come into a relationship with him. He wants their sins forgiven. But they have to humble themselves like a little child and admit their need and come to him and ask for it and, and repent, of course, and all these things. So what a great savior we have. What a, he's thought of everything. He's thought of, he's thought of uh, just a way for us to have a relationship with him. And just he's thought of how he can reveal his heart to us by seeing him weep over a city. I believe he weeps over the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only unique son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gets to decide how we get to heaven, not us. God gets to decide. And we have to humble ourselves and accept the salvation that he's provided. And it's all there for the asking. It's all there for receiving. The invitation is open to everybody. Nobody is too good to be saved. No one is too bad to be saved. It's open to everybody. What a savior, amen? Amen. Let's, Let's pray together. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would use these verses and work these verses in our hearts Lord, where, where are we to go except you're the one that has words of eternal life, Lord. We're so grateful. And I pray for anyone in this room that hasn't received you yet. I pray, Lord, that, that you would continue to draw them to you, Lord, and just melt their hearts, Lord, melt their hearts. I pray, Lord, that any previous ideas that are un, unbiblical or not aligned with truth, that you would make those go away and help them to see the reality the truth of 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 you and your and and what you offer lord as a free gift so we thank you for that we thank you for your beautiful gospel we thank you in jesus name amen